Hello, and welcome to episode 114 of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. My name is Seth Perrin, historian and deputy director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum here at Camp Shelby. And with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host, retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the Fast Attack Submarine USS Indianapolis, Commodore of Submarine Squadron 3 in Pearl Harbor, and many other postings. Bill, how are you this fine October morning? I'm still doing great. Yeah, it is October, isn't it? Almost, it is. almost through October. Yeah, and the time is, she is mm. clipping along, as they say. Weather's beautiful, too, by the way. I don't know about... Florida, it's, it's almost yeah. always great. We miss the yeah. hurricane kind of just sat on us, but uh, no damage. We're happy about that. That's always a good thing. Yeah. Well, uh, let's dive into it. Uh, today, we're going to tackle one of the more controversial episodes of the Guadalcanal campaign. And we're going to tackle without a doubt is the worst. This is what's considered the worst defeat in United States Navy history. Uh, that, of course, is the Battle of Savo Island, August 8th, 9th, 1942. Uh, now, the battle itself unfolded and was executed in a relatively short amount of time, less than two hours total, really, from start to finish. Uh, but in those terrible hours, the entire pre-war U.S. Navy surface battle force doctrine was utterly destroyed by nighttime Japanese naval gunfire and incredibly destructive Japanese long lance torpedoes. Pre-war tactics, the aforementioned doctrine, and arrogance on the part of the U.S. Navy was sent sinking to the bottom of the waters that what would soon be called Iron Bottom Sound, along with the lives of over 1,000 American sailors and their allies. Now, you know, Bill, when you talk about Guadalcanal and the sea battles, this is the first thing you think about because it is the first sea battle in Guadalcanal, but it's thought about for all the wrong reasons and when it comes to the United States Navy, isn't it? It is. In, in fact, you know, we, because this is the worst sea battle in the United States Navy treat, history, it needs to be treated with a certain degree of reverence. We want to learn from it. And there are a bunch of lessons of this from this battle that are absolutely relevant to any conflict that might emerge in the Pacific today. But one of the points I want to make on Savo is that those of you who buy into the mythology that the Navy abandoned the Marine Corps in Guadalcanal, um, it needs to study this battle to fully understand what really happened there. And then suddenly, when you see the outcome here with over a thousand sailors killed at sea at Savo Island with, you know, you know, very minimal losses at this point on the beach for the Marines and sailors that were ashore on Guadalcanal. You can understand a bit why the Navy had to think about regrouping and limiting the losses. Otherwise, there would be no way they could pr protect those Marines and sailors ashore. Mm -hmm. So some rethinking did emerge following this battle. It was very uh, overdue. And and we'll talk about the details as we go along. Yeah, it's it's Savo Island is is a mess, and it, and it does you know as we were saying, it, it does inform everything that happens afterwards, mm -hmm. and, and and everything as I said in the in the intro, everything that that we we being the U.S. Navy thought we knew about surface warfare is just it, it's rewritten. You know, and, mm -hmm. and it influences everything. You know, we'll get to Admiral Fletcher's decision. And as you said, the whole, you know, abandonment of the Marines by the Navy, which, of course, did not happen. Let's be abundantly clear here. It did not happen. But there's reasons for the way that commanders acted and what happened. Yeah. And the reasons that they did what they did. And a, a bit about the order of battle going into, I, I, I'm going to let you cover the Japanese, you know, way more than about the Japanese order of battle than I do. On the American side, the the primary fighting force um, during this battle, the engaged force, and this is very unusual and it's an important lesson here, was commanded by a British admiral yes. named Crutchley, who is embarked on an Australian ship, HMAS Australia. Mm -hmm. And there was a second Australian cruiser, the Canberra, that was part of this little, you know, battle force. 
And the battle force was divided roughly into two distinct segments of, you know, four cruisers, one segment to the north of Savo, one to the south. And the chain of command uh, during the battle was very ethereal. I mean, it was it was basic. It was very um, misunderstood by those participating in the battle, and that's a key point here. So let me let me replay that for you. You got a British admiral who's in command only by virtue of the fact that he's the only admiral in this group of ships, yep. commanding a primarily American force from on a, an Australian ship. Okay, get, wrap your head around that. And then ask yourself, okay, why didn't this go so well for us? And there are going to be command and control issues. We'll talk about it all starts there. And to make matters worse, the British admirals called away for a conference and decides to drive his ship to this conference. It was with Admiral Turner, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he leaves with the Australian ship Australia. From the scene of battle, at, before the battle begins, before battle, yeah, right. because nobody believes that this nighttime assault will occur. So he's not even present when the battle begins. And his, you know, we could just say that his handoff of tactical command of the, the ships in the strike force was, left something to be desired. Big time. Nobody really knew who was in charge after he left. Yeah. Um, well, there wasn't anybody in charge, theoretically. You know, I mean, well, theoretically there was, but in actuality, there wasn't. And we'll right. we'll, we'll get to that. And this mm-hmm. is what this is what causes, well, <laughs> we'll get to one it. of the many factors that <laughs> yeah. causes the um melee that's about the, to occur. The debacle. I mean, that's yeah, it's, 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 it's a it's a catastrophe. It really yeah. is. It really is. But let's mm-hmm. let's let's start at the beginning. The the pre, you know, I mentioned the pre-war US Navy surface battle doctrine. And we don't need to get into every nook and cranny, nut and bolt of the whole doctrine, but it's important to point out, and this is this is what leads to what happened, or part of what leads to what happens here, is that the U.S. Navy uh, pre-war was built on the thought that you know it was we've talked about this before as a battleship admiral's navy, mm-hmm. even with the the introduction of the aircraft carrier as the primary weapon of the Pacific Fleet, which it, it by now is. And the, and the advent, well, I don't want to say advent, but the introduction of the submarines as the long range striking force that they are now in terms of our timeline here, you know, August 1942. It's the Navy, for all intents and purposes, is still based around the big gun. And right. with that being said, the Navy planned for any major surface action to be fought against the enemy. And in, in, in this case, obviously, it's the, the Japanese mm-hmm. would be fought in broad daylight and perfect in a line weather. Of battle. Yeah, in a line in a traditional line of battle and mm-hmm. perfect weather near the Philippines and ex, and at extreme range of the U.S. Navy's rifles and the battle, you know, the main arm and main battery and battleships. Right, and that's how they govern themselves. That's how they govern their training, surface ship training. There was very little nighttime train. There was some. But there was very little nighttime training done by the U.S. Navy pre-war and even during the war. After Guadalcanal, that changed. But but before this, there was very little nighttime training. Radar was a new advent. It was you know highly untrusted by very very by a great many of not only the skippers on on the ships but the admirals too. And mm-hmm. it was just it was we were it, it, woefully it, unprepared for the scenario which was about to unfold. It wasn't trusted, but. Then this is paradoxical. It added to the notion that the nighttime battle is going to be unlikely because everybody in these days, remember, in, when this occurred, gunfire targeting was optical. Mm-hmm. You needed to see the target. Actually, you had a ranging system where two separate separated systems needed to see the target to get an accurate range. And nobody thought that that was going to happen because you know, it's so difficult to see at night. Now, we did silly things in retrospect, not so silly, but things like illuminating the enemy ships with spotlights mm. or with flares. But again, you, you had to want to engage at night. 
in order to do any of those kinds of preparations. Mm -hmm. That's point number one. Point number two, to the extent that radar affected the outcome of the battle, it kind of reassured us that the night battle wouldn't happen because we had radar and we were pretty yes. sure the Japanese didn't. Now, we didn't do what we needed to do to test radar, to understand its limitations. We believed it could do more than it could actually do. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about the two destroyers. Sure the radar pickets and their failure in, in a moment. But yeah, the radar actually gave us more confidence yeah. that we were unlikely to suffer a nighttime assault. A false sense of security it, right. it, you know, it is, is exactly what it did, even though, as you said, you know, a lot of admirals and commanders, captains of the ships didn't really believe in it, yet they mm -hmm. were putting a lot of their faith into this newfangled contraption. Magic yeah. system. Right? Yeah, magic box. Yeah, <laughs> really. And, you know, I said arrogance, and we've mentioned the American arrogance before in, in several other episodes when it comes to the Japanese. There was this, you know, as I said, you know, the pre-war doctrine meant that, you know, we were going to engage the Japanese. And by the way, the Japanese also figured on the climactic battle. We've talked about this in our midway episodes and different episodes before. But we just merely assumed that the half-witted Japanese would just sally forth and, you know, present their ships for us to shoot full of holes yeah. because, you know, that's what well, we're Americans. That's what we're going to do by God. And so that's just obviously they're going to fight just like us. Exactly. Just and not, won't, we won't be as good. It, right. <laughs> <laughs> Far from it. But, you know, the Japanese had brains in their heads and, you know, surprise, surprise here. They were also fully aware that that was more than likely the United States' plan. Now, we outnumbered the Japanese pre-war in terms of battleship guns and, and cruiser guns, too, for that matter. Heavy cruisers, I'm talking about. Japanese were aware of that. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they're, they trained for the event that would take place here at Savo and, frankly, all of the surface battles at Guadalcanal. They trained specifically to fight the U.S. Navy at night. And using what I would call Sun Tzu doctrine, which is we're going to leverage our strength against the enemy's weakness. Yes. And if we believe we're strong at night fighting and they aren't, that's when we want to engage. And it was in their mind, a battle of attrition. Yes. Absolutely. Where they were going to knock us off one by one by one by one, leading to the great historic. Right. Um, you know, battle that would decide the final outcome of the war, yeah. which they realized would happen later, not, yeah. not this early. Yeah, the Jutland of World War II, if you will. Right. So to that end, the Japanese developed, you know, all kinds of different practices, all kinds of different technologies in preparation for these night battles. You mentioned it in an episode previous that the Japanese hand-selected guys that were lookouts, guys to be lookouts, on their cruisers and destroyers who had demonstrated ability at night vision. Yeah, they would give them night visual acuity tests, mm -hmm. something I never probably would have sucked at, right? But they, <laughs> they put them in in dark rooms and they and they saw well, we they they learned that some guys were way better at seeing things at night than others. Sure. Just natural ability. And then they classified those guys basically gave them gave them special qualifications as nighttime lookouts yep. we did nothing of the sort no not at all not at all we basically just said okay you're going to be a lookout tonight get mm -hmm. your ass over there <laughs> on the flag bridge and here's a pair of binoculars yeah which the japanese you know wisely did that because they intended to fight at night they they mm -hmm. yes they wanted to have their climactic battle at sea you know and we've talked about this you know the yamato is going to engage the american battle force at extreme range and shoot them full of holes but they also formulated their battle plans for really everything as an attrition an attritional plan just like you just said and that the japanese submarines the destroyers the heavy cruisers were going to make these slashing attacks at, mm -hmm. at the American battle force as it was theoretically going to sally forth across the Pacific to engage the main battle force of the Japanese. And once that happened in the battleships would shoot each other up, but in so doing, they put great, they, the Japanese put great emphasis on the use of torpedoes. Yeah. You know, when I talk about this a lot, the way to sink a ship is not to punch a hole above the waterline. Right. The way to sink a ship is to punch a hole below the waterline and, and let the water get into the hull. Right. That's how you sink a ship, right? So they planned 
on vigorous torpedo attacks using their destroyers primarily, but even their cruisers were capable of doing. Right. Remember that a destroyer emerged from a type of ship called the torpedo boat destroyer. Mm -hmm. They were primarily intended as with torpedoes as the primary weapon. That was on both sides, Japanese mm -hmm. and American side. The difference being the Japanese planned on and trained on nighttime torpedo attacks, yep. whereas we didn't. And in this battle in particular, that becomes a huge advantage for the Japanese. By focusing on by focusing on nighttime torpedo attacks, we talked about the guys who are especially classified as basically nocturnal lookouts, for lack of a better term. They also developed some serious optics, serious nighttime optics that could scout and see targets at extreme ranges that we, as the United States, had no inclination that the Japanese ever would have developed this or even had the ability to do this. Some of the ranges that these guys could see, and we'll get to this as the battle develops, I mean, it's it's unbelievable that these people could visually see these targets. I mean, I'm talking mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of yards, not 2,000 yards. Yeah. And as someone who thousands. stood watch on the bridge at night, let me tell you, that is in the middle of the ocean. It is really freaking dark. And I, <laughs> and I have had issues if, if the ships weren't lit. You know, they didn't have the running lights going. You know, seeing small boats and things like that that weren't lit when they're hundreds of yards away, yeah. let alone thousands. It's it's incredible. It's incredible. And in in so talking about the torpedo attacks and their whole basic nighttime fight, nighttime fighting doctrine was based off of these slashing torpedo attacks from destroyers and cruisers. They developed well, it's not probably, it is the single most deadly torpedo of World War II. It's called the Long Lance. It was a. It was called the Type ninety three Long Lance. It was developed in the early nineteen thirties, and uh, this thing is a beast. I, I forget. I, I don't remember how it long is, it was, but it is the most powerful torpedo in the world yeah. at the time. I yeah. and I, I'm I'm thinking it was on the order of twenty feet long. It's huge. Um, and the, the it was it was fueled by kerosene, but rather than putting compressed air into the oxidizer tanks like most torpedoes did. They used compressed oxygen, mm -hmm. which really extended the, did two things. Number one, it extended the range mm -hmm. of the torpedo because the, the tank could hold more oxygen as the oxidizer than if it was air filled. And the second thing it did was it would burn in such a way that the only gas that was produced was carbon dioxide and, and water vapor. And since carbon dioxide is soluble in water, it produced almost no wake. So those were the two advantages. You couldn't see the thing. It had an extremely long range and it had a super big punch. It had a really powerful warhead over twice the warhead that we had. Now, in parallel, I mean, in contrast with that, this in early in the war, the United States was having terrible problems with our torpedoes. Mm -hmm. they, they essentially didn't work. And <laughs> the Bureau, you know, the Bureau of Ammunition refused to admit that they didn't work. And it wasn't until a bunch of submarine commanders came home in late 1943, where they bounced torpedoes off of ships that failed to explode, did the Navy, the United States Navy, take our torpedo problems seriously. Mm -hmm. So the Japanese had a very effective weapon that had been tested in combat and worked extremely well. And we had essentially you know, spitballs with slingshots to yeah. fire back at them. That's exactly right. I mean, you know, you talk about, you talked about the, the warhead on the long lance. This is over a thousand pounds of explosives and the nose of this beast. Mm -hmm. And we talked about the extreme range. I want the listeners to wrap their brains around this. This 1,090 pounds is exactly what it was. Warhead had a range of 22,000 yards. 22,000 yards at about 50 knots, which is yeah. about 58 miles an hour. Right. Yeah. So uh, this is crazy. It wasn't until the 1960s that the United States had something that was comparable. And it's that's unbelievable. Just, again, I, I shot what we call Mark 48 torpedoes, later ADCAP, advanced capability torpedoes that are, that were effectively about the same range and speed and, and punch warhead size right. as the Japanese were using in World War II. And oh, by the way, the Type 95 torpedo, which is what Japanese submarines used, mm -hmm. had a, essentially the same warhead. 
it was a shortened to fit into a submarine torpedo tube. And so it had shorter range, but it had the same speed and the same warhead, which meant it had the same punch. And we'll be talking about Japanese submarine attacks in a later episode. Mm -hmm. but, but, but this was an incredibly effective torpedo. This is it's a ship killer. It's a ship. It killer. is and, designed and, to kill battleships, yes. not just any ship. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, we talked about the weaponry. We talked about the advances in technology. And, you know, this is August 8th, the night of August 8th, 1942. So American Marines, United States Marines have landed on Tulagi and Guadalcanal less than 24 hours previous. You know, on August 7th, we got we got boots on the ground. We knew the Japanese that were going to respond. We did not know or figure how fast that they would respond. We talked about, you know, in, in our uh, episode book called Operation Watchtower, we talked about, you know, the fact that the Japanese army, the Imperial army was a little bit slow. You know, they weren't exactly ready to go, but the Imperial Navy was ready to rock and roll at a moment's notice. And this is exactly what happens here. The first major Japanese, major, mind you, major Japanese response to the landings at Tulagi and Guadalcanal was launched by Admiral Mikawa, who is going to factor heavily into what we're going to talk about here at 0830 on August 7th, two and a half hours after we landed on Guadalcanal and Tulagi, yep. Japanese said, oh, hey, look at we got to do something about this. This isn't a raid. They're here <laughs> and we're going to get them out. Yeah. This guy was no fool. He was not going to mess around. 830 in the morning, he starts making plans. His orders were to assemble his cruiser division, which is cruiser, crew Div six, right? I think for this battle, it's called uh, crew Div 18, I believe, or, or cruiser division 18, uh, and prepare for a night attack on the American fleet anchored off of Guadalcanal. It's now they know they're there. And, and they're uh, we're still unloading the transports at this oh, yeah. point, right? So the, yep. or the American fleet is there to protect the transports as Correct. they're being unloaded to support the Marines. Correct. And we got to remember, too, we got to go back in time a little bit, is that Earlier on August 7th, or actually, I guess it would be later, however you want to term it, you know, the Japanese launched an aerial attack against our transport fleet and actually hit a couple of our ships, including the George F. Elliott, which, you know, were landing uh, Marines from the 1st Marine Regiment. So, I mean, the Japanese knew we were there. They knew that we had a fleet, you know, in force there. They were also keenly aware that there were more than likely American aircraft carriers there, mainly because carrier aircraft engaged Japanese aircraft the day before. So, you know, this all factored into Macau's plans. Uh, his orders were to his force were to in, were intercepted. So he he issues orders to assemble his his task force and that they were going to prepare to sally forth down to Guadalcanal and go punch through whatever American ships are out there. This is one of the many factors that lie into you, you're going to scratch your head and go, good God, what happened here? The actual Japanese orders sent by Macau to his forces were intercepted by U.S. codebreakers, script analysts, that day. But they were not deciphered until August 23rd. Two weeks after the, the battle, basically. Right. What's the point of having I mean, intelligence yeah, if you're not going to read it? In, in their defense, they were intercepting a lot of message sure. traffic at this point. And, and it was very difficult to determine which of these messages were important and which go into the B pile, right, and to be decoded later. And obviously, after the battle occurred, people are going through and sorting through and seeing what did we miss? What can we learn from this? And let me say that there's a lot of conspiracy theorists out there that, that will point to this or that event and saying, well, the message traffic was it was radioed is the Navy expression. What that means is was um, doctored to make it to cover up for malfeasance. Mm -hmm. Something bad happened. And we're going to cover it up by hooking the books, the, the radio logs or whatever, pretending we didn't receive this radio message that we finally decoded on August 23rd. And if any, if there was ever a time when somebody would have wanted to cook the books, this yeah. would have been it. Because how can you admit it resulted in the death of over a thousand sailors? How can you admit that we could have known they were on the way, but failed to um, decode that that message. If you're going to cover something up, this is it. And the fact that they didn't cover it, and it became a matter of history and a lesson to be learned, is really important. Now, there are a whole bunch of um, circumstances around the delay, and it has to do with the split of where the message was received, 
and how long it took to get to where it was needed mm-hmm. and, and things like that. There was there were divisions in the chain of command. We've covered that already. A lot of the supporting aircraft were, were out of General MacArthur's mm-hmm. AOR. Mm-hmm. There, there, and, and there was not good communications or command and control of those aircraft in, to, in support of the Navy operations that were occurring there. And so there was a whole bunch of screw ups that added to this screw up on the message. Oh, man, go ahead, it, Seth. And it keep and it just keeps on going. It's a snowball. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, this is the first screw up and it just mm-hmm. it just snowballs, snowballs all the way down. Yep. Yeah, it's ridiculous. By eleven hundred hours on August eighth. 1100, this is, you know, less than 24 hours after, or a little bit more, I'm sorry, a little bit more than 24 hours after he issues the order. Uh, McCow's force had been assembled and they're at sea. They're on their way. This is August 8th, 1942, the day after they landed in Guadalcanal. McCow's cruiser force is with destroyers are on their way. They're, they're cooking it and they're moving too. They're not, you know, taking their dear sweet time. They, they're, they're doing about 20, 25 knots. They're getting down there pretty quick. Um, Macau, keenly aware that there was going to be more than likely American aircraft carriers in the vicinity. And he also wanted to know what the hell was he was potentially going to be facing. He launches scout planes to determine the allied strength before he ever got into the area. Wise choice. You know, one of AOBA, that's one of the cruisers in the force, uh, the scout planes found the U.S. fleet off Guadalcanal and Tulagi and reported it very accurately as four heavy cruisers, seven destroyers, one phantom battleship off Lungan Point. There was no battleship. Um, it's my belief that he was identifying the Australia the, mm-hmm. the heavy, as, as a battleship. Um, two cruisers, heavy cruisers, 12 destroyers, and three transports anchored off Tulagi. So the, the Japanese scouts knew, with the exception of the phantom battleship, knew what they were going to be facing. Makawa also knew at this point that the American force was divided in strength. At least at this point. And of course, you know, he's hinging a lot on that uh, later on as if they still remain divided at night when he goes into attack. But that being said, with that information in hand, his plan, McCow's plan, was to penetrate the sound. This, of course, is what it's going to be called Iron Bottom Sound, Sea Lark Channel, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, south of Savo Island. Uh, his plan was to torpedo the U.S. ships there and then engage the Tulagi force. Uh, with gunfire and torpedoes, after which he would withdraw northward. So this is, if you look at it, it's it's pretty sly. He was going to slip in there, shoot torpedoes out, which, of course, don't really produce much of a noise or any. But there's a little bit of a flash when they come out of the torpedo tube, but nothing like an eight-inch gun will provide. Right. And torpedo no, the second. Basically, no warning that yeah. you're, you're about to blow up. Yeah, there's fish in the water, and you don't realize it until you're, you know, 30 feet in the air. But that was his plan. And then to slide up the back end of the northern force around Savo and shoot the bejesus out of them before they ever knew what happened. And that's kind of what happened to a point. Yeah. So in contrast with their very accurate identification of our force, we had airplanes up as well, raiding Rabal and things like that. We did. Some of MacArthur's B-17s and we and and some of Admiral McCain's, this is Lou McCain. Senator John McCain's grandfather, shore-based aircraft mm-hmm. that were that sighted the airplane, the, the Japanese ships as well. Did we yeah. do as good with our recognition as they did with ours? Not even close. <laughs> so, 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 so the B-17s you're referring to actually sighted Macau's force twice, not once, but twice. Uh, they were first found by B-17s that had raided Rabaul, as you said, and they were ID'd as four cruisers and one destroyer. So, eh, you know, not so bad. Not so bad. Not so bad. They were seen again by another B-17 as that was part of that same force and reported as just simply six unidentified ships heading southeast. They weren't even they weren't even they didn't even have the right direction in which they were heading. Mm -hmm. Um, That's failure number two in our list right there. So that's two, two, two shots they've had at identifying this force coming down and they failed at both times. They were sound, they were heard by a United States submarine, the S thirty eight. S thirty eight reports uh, sends a report that DDs destroyers, several of them, are passing overhead at a very high rate of speed, and three heavy cruisers were passing overhead of her on a course of one four zero degrees. This is actually the most accurate report. I know this will bring you joy, but <laughs> the submarine. Yeah. This is the most accurate report of the incoming force that is found Mm -hmm. that that is sent out uh s38 report carried as i said carried the most weight but it was dismissed 
by Richmond Kelly Turner under the assumption that a large enemy surface force would be seen by search planes first. And since he didn't know that they had, it, they actually had, right? But he didn't exactly. know it. Exactly. Because that report didn't get to him. He just said, ah, oh, those submariners, they don't know what they're talking about. And he and basically failed to put the fleet on alert. Yeah. And and, and this and, and S-38 report was the most accurate report because, I mean, they went right over the top of the dang thing. Mm -hmm. So, he, you know, he kind of figured it out pretty quick. Admiral Fletcher hears about this. This message does get transmitted through. Admiral Fletcher hears about this. He requests uh, another aerial search to be put out by Admiral McCain, by Slew McCain's people. And, and McCain's would be shore based aircraft. Shore based aircraft, Navy. exactly. Right. And they failed to comply. They just. Mm. Isn't didn't that amazing? Do it. Yeah. yeah. You're given an order during in a combat zone by your operational commander and you just don't do it, Matt. It just was a suggestion. It, it wasn't yeah. an order. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is unconscionable. Yeah, it, it is. And I mean, and, and to be clear, McCain did have, it wasn't him personally, but I mean, his, they were under his command. He did have aircraft out there in a search pattern. Uh, Lockheed Hudson's actually is what they were. He did have aircraft out there, but he didn't have enough aircraft out there, number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, the, the, the areas in which they were searching were, in my opinion, too large. But that being said, a couple of McCain's Lockheed Hudson's did indeed sight Macawa again. So this is going to be one, two, three, four, the fourth time that these ships are sighted by American forces of one shape, one way, shape or form. Uh, the Lockheed Hudson cite Macau's force, and they're then, they are then plotted by Turner. So this information is sent back to Richmond Kelly Turner. Kelly Turner. Mm. He gets the information. Turner himself goes in there and plots the course of the Japanese ships that are reported as uh, – they were erroneously stated as being seaplane tenders, yeah, let me heavy let me, cruisers. Let me riff on that for a second. Go for it. In the 1980s, we were still conducting recognition training, which – means in the 90s, and, and I, I assume we're still doing it today, although I'm not an active submariner today, where you flash a picture of a ship up really quickly, and then you're expected to be able to recognize what class it is. And I did this, we did this weekly for my entire active submarine career. And apparently they weren't doing it in, in an active combat zone with, with these um, ships, because there's no way you should mistake a cruiser for a seaplane tender. Just no way. And so this is like gross error number 72 leading to this battle. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And I mean, and this is what this probably, at least again, in my professional opinion, is the, the sighting report. Now, granted, S-38 was the most accurate, but this is the sighting report that probably does, or lack thereof, does the most damage to what is about to unfold because... Based on the fact, quote, that this Japanese force contains seaplane tenders, which, of course, it did not. It did not. It's heavy cruisers and destroyers by now mm -hmm. boiling down the Guadalcanal in excess of 28 knots. I mean, these guys are cooking, getting down there. Right. Turner plotted it himself and assumed that because they were seaplane tenders, they did not possess the speed to get to the area. Nor were they a, a real threat, right? Right, exactly. And the, and the worst, you know, when, when you're viewing a ship from an airplane, I have done this, the thing you're, you're most likely to get wrong is your estimate of speed. Mm -hmm. You can get classification right, you can get course right, a whole bunch of things you can get right. Location, you know, we call it the datum. What you get wrong is going to be the speed. And, mm -hmm. and if they had better, but now you can, wake length, as it as it's relative to the ship length mm -hmm. can tell you something about speed if they had spent the time to to try to get a better sense of how fast these ships were going and they realized the ships were going let's just say in excess of 22 knots we don't even need to say 28 which is something that was knowable by them then turner would have known hey wait a minute no. seaplane tenders can't do 22 knots mm -hmm. those must not be seaplane tenders and it would have been a little bit more data that he could have used to fill in the blank that this is a real threat. 
Yeah. As a matter of fact, you mentioned the speeds. The speed was reported by the Hudsons as 15 knots, okay. which is a little yeah. less than half of what the ships were actually making. But based on that knowledge, or again, false knowledge, mm-hmm. but based on that knowledge, Turner assumed that it's like, A, these are seaplane tenders. They're not going to come in here to do battle with our surface force. B, they'll never make it off the anchorage in time to do a night, to, to conduct a night engagement. And therefore, he didn't really issue any kind of alert that there was an inbound force at all. Right. And so what does Turner do to British Admiral Crutchley, who's commanding, who's on the Australia? He decides to call a conference, right? Yeah. And Crutchley goes in and he does, you know, he complies with the order that he has given. And this is, in my opinion, one another, yet another of the great misfortunes that befalls these forces that are Amer- allied forces that are off the coast of Talagi and Guadalcan or Savo Island. Um, he basically doesn't leave anybody really in charge. He leaves Captain Reef Cole, who's aboard the USS Vincennes. He was the most senior captain there, but he was a captain and he's a mm-hmm. captain and there's nothing against a captain, Captain Toady, but he's in, <laughs> ch- but he's in charge of his ship. He's a captain of his ship. He's not you know, if you look at any other, uh, and, th- and that's dispersion. not unusual, by the way. They it's, we call it SOPA, mm-hmm. Senior Operational President of uh, afloat SOPA. So the senior CO is what you're talking about. Will take command of the entire group. He'll be the SOPA, and and ships operate like that all the time. It's not a big deal, but but what he screwed up was letting everybody know, hey, I'm leaving. I got to go to this conference. I'm taking the Australia with me. You know, uh, the CEO of Astoria is now SOPA. and Vin- Vincent, take, Vincent. Uh, Vincent, sorry, is now SOPA. And you're going to take your instructions from him until I get back. That kind of guidance was never transmitted. No, yeah. I mean, there were there were forces, including Captain Bodie, who was aboard, who was a CEO of USS Chicago. He didn't know what the hell was going on. And he was part of Crutchley's Southern Force. He mm-hmm. didn't know what the hell was going on. He didn't know. Literally, I mean, he literally knew nothing, and that will unfold here uh, many times over in the next coming, you know, coming minutes. But yeah. and by the way, I screwed up. So, but senior officer, president afloat. Go ahead. Ah, but it, it was it was a complete failure in the chain of command and the communications by the senior allied man aboard ship, right there, Admiral Crutchley. So, had he conducted his you know chain of command properly, had he executed orders properly. You know, things may have been avoided. I mean, and and it's it's disgusting is that there were so many things that could have gone right that did not yeah. here. And it just it it just as I said, it snowballs. Mm-hmm. Turner, get back to Admiral Turner. Turner believed that the Japanese were setting up this this sea seaplane tenders that were coming in here, and this again leads to what happens. He believed that these so called seaplane tenders were going into Rakata Bay to set up a seaplane base. Mm-hmm. That they were not a cruiser force coming down to put a beating on him of epic proportions. And that just, you know, snowballs with Crutchley leaving and everything else. Mm-hmm. So what the one thing that Crutchley does do before he bails, essentially, is he splits his force. We already kind of talked about this briefly as the Japanese actually side of the American, the Allied force that was split into two. And we'll give a breakdown on this now so people can understand what's going to happen here. Uh, Crutchley decides to split his force, and he reasoned, and rightfully so, that there were two areas that enemy ships could slip into the area without being detected. One would be north of Savo Island, one would be south of Savo Island. By splitting his forces, he thought that one force was bound to intercept anything that may be coming in. And at that point, too, let's also be clear that any attack that might come was thought to be destroyers, that they may come in here and launch a few, tor- few torpedoes and get out. So by doing that, he set up two groups. He set up a Southern group and a Northern group. The Southern group consisted of the heavy cruiser Australia, as we mentioned, the Canberra, as we mentioned, uh, the USS Chicago, along with two destroyers, the Bagley and the Patterson. We'll hear about the Patterson in a few. Uh, The Northern group consisted of the heavy cruisers Vincennes, Quincy, and Astoria, along with the destroyers Helm and Wilson. Aside from these two, Bill, you talked about it, Briefly, when we set it up, there were two 
picket destroyers that were radar pickets and radar pickets are going to factor into everything the U.S. Navy does from here on into the end of the war, especially off of Okinawa. But that's many episodes in the future. <laughs> but these two destroyers was USS Talbot and USS Blue. Both of these DDs were equipped with radar. It was early radar, but it was, I believe, was it SG radar at this SG, time? Yes. It was SG. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's a surface radar. And it had an effective range of about 10,000 yards, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. And that's if the weather's good. Yeah, because <clears throat> because rain did obscure it and, and it depended on the operator. Mm -hmm. and, and again, what was not done here, these two ships were selected because they were supposedly the best radar ships in the group. And there's they were selected to be this picket line specifically for the radar ability. But what nobody ever did we say okay we're going to we're going to steam some ships by you at night darkened ship and we're going to see how effective what the percentage or probability is probability of detect it's called that you detect these ships and so we really had no idea this is kind of part of the calibration routine that should have been done that wasn't done we really had no idea whether they would have detect a ship one out of four times or eight out of 10 times wow. we didn't know and as it turned out, the Japanese steamed within the detection range of one or both of these destroyers and were never detected. No. And they were they steamed within visual range too, not just radar right. range. That's right. Visual range. And they were not seen. So, you know, it we're setting up for a huge disaster. And and, and it's just it it. It, it plays out exactly as we're setting it up here. The battle begins actually right before midnight at about 23 hours on August 8th. Mikawa, now he's closing in on the area right now. He sends a search plane off of one of his cruisers to illuminate the shipping around Tulagi and Guadalcanal with flares. Uh, there's float planes. Uh, one of the float planes that he sends off there reports radio communications back to Macau's force that there are three heavy cruisers off of Savo Island, which is 100% oh, right. Um, at 2,400 hours, so this is midnight, uh, Macau formed his ships and increased his speed to 26 knots. Now he knows what he's about to face, and this is pretty ballsy on Macau's. So he's actually outnumbered by Allied guns. He's, there are more Allied, and by I say Allied, because there's Australian and American ships out there, there's more Allied guns than there are Japanese guns. He's counting on the element of surprise, and he also knows that his enemy is split into two forces. This has been confirmed twice now that the American and Australian British the Allied force is split into two forces. So he knows that even though we possess uh, you know, a superior number of guns, he the, the, the force is split here so he can pick them off one by one if he so chooses, which is exactly what he does. Uh, 50 minutes after midnight at 0050, Savo was sighted by the Japanese. And three minutes later, Makawa's lookout sighted the picket destroyer USS Blue and evaded her. USS Blue's radar is kicking. They theoretically have lookouts aboard, you know, looking for enemy targets. And the Japanese sailed right by him. Never even knew. Macau was smart enough to decrease speed as he was passing Blue so as to not kick up too much of a wake that could potentially be seen by blue the, the bioluminescence could be seen right. visually and the wake might be detected on radar so that's why he slowed down exactly right yeah i mean the guy was he was slick <laughs> he mm -hmm. was slick so lookouts aboard the heavy cruiser chokai uh sighted three heavy cruisers off the starboard bow at this point Macau orders his ships to independently fire quote unquote that was his exact orders at 0138, four long lance torpedoes were launched at the same time lookout spotted the USS Vincennes at a range of, this is visually, at a range of 18,000 yards. We talked about those night, especially night trained uh, mm -hmm. lookouts, Japanese lookouts yeah. and the nighttime optics, 18,000 yards visually sighted the USS Vincennes. Yeah. And again, the tactic here is the moment you fire a gun, the you can hear it and see it. And the, you lose the element of surprise. Mm -hmm. But if you shoot your torpedoes first, which they did, something blows up. Now everybody knows you're there. Well, they, they may not know <laughs> where you are, 
They may not even know what happened because explosions can happen without enemy fire, right? But but at least you have, you know, you, you preserve the element of surprise until that torpedo blows the ship up and then you can open fire with your guns because now the element of surprise is now gone. Exactly. So he launches the torpedoes. He, he orders that four long lances be shot at, at 0138. At 0143, he has... Mikawa has closed range enough to the American cruisers in the southern group now. This is the Canberra and, and, the, and the aforementioned ships that were done minus the HMAS Australia. He has closed the range to where it's now bordering on dangerous if he doesn't open fire with his main battery. At 0143, he gives the order, Chokai opens fire with her main battery on the HMAS Canberra. Shortly before Chokai opened fire, Canberra's lookouts spotted the enemy. 4,500 yards. This is close, man. 4,500 yards dead ahead. Yeah. Her lookout spotted the Japanese coming in. By that point, it was too late, though. Mm -hmm. Canberra is put into a turn as so as to allow her main battery. Now, obviously, she's trying, her, to, she's trying to unmask her main battery. Right. She's trying to let loose with everything she mm -hmm. has. I mean, her turrets rotate, obviously, yeah. but it would have been quicker if they just Turn the boat, which is exactly mm -hmm. what they try to do here. As Canberra is put into a turn to allow her main battery to open fire, before her main battery was even manned, she's lit up, illuminated by Japanese searchlights, and she is hit by over 24 8-inch shells from four Japanese heavy cruisers. This is within seconds. So the Japanese had her trained. They, they visually spotted Canberra. They had their weapons trained on the ship. As soon as they illuminated the ship, boom, it was on. By now, just to defend them a minute, the, their main batteries weren't manned because they weren't at general quarters. Exactly. You can't maintain 24-7 general quarters. Mm -hmm. So you stand watch in an, in an alerted, because you're in a combat zone condition, uh, just short of general quarters. But the moment something happens to any one of these ships, key point, every one of these ships should have been alerted and manned general quarters. And so Canberra is trying to get to general quarters. Is she alerting the fleet? No. That, that she's that she's seen somebody? Is she as she's manning general quarters? Are the other ships manning general quarters at the same time? No. Sadly, no. Sadly, no. Within so I said at 0143, Chokai opens fire and, and she's joined by Aoba and Kinugasa and the rest of the Japanese cruisers in the force by 0150. Seven minutes after the Japanese open fire, Canberra slows to a stop and it's burning amidships. She's already, you know, done for essentially. She's a mission kill at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And there's thoughts that she might have been hit by a torpedo, but I do believe that the underwater surveillance never did confirm that she was, if, if right. I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, we're talking about the discovery of Canberra by uh, by Paul Allen's uh, yeah, petrol. petrol ship right. in in the decade in the last decade yeah and and it's so she's already shot full of holes and she slows to a stop uh and canberra is eventually scuttled by by allied forces the next morning but it's a it's a death field aboard canberra right now um the next heavy cruiser in line is the uss chicago captained by the aforementioned captain Bodie. um aboard chicago now Flashes were seen, as I said, as the torpedoes were launched from the Japanese cruisers and destroyers, too, by the way. Flashes were seen as they left the tubes. Yeah, now uh, here, get this, get this, the deck officer is seeing things explode, yes. seeing flashes from gunfire. And, you know, and, and by the way, I, I, I've i tried to determine whether you pronounce his name Bode or Bodhi over the years. And and I'm not sure <laughs> which it is, actually. Maybe you maybe, you know, but I, but again, I don't know. He, I went to school with a girl last name spelled the same way she was Bodhi. So, just, Bode, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it might be right. And that, that was my presumption, too. But I've heard a whole bunch of people call him Bode. However, the officer of the deck in that situation automatically and without orders should man man general quarters. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It should, you know, Bueller sound general quarters. Um, Nothing. Didn't happen. Nothing. Didn't done. happen. Right? But that's not the only thing Chicago zone. saw. That's Go not ahead. the only thing that happened. Yeah. So they see flashes from the torpedo launches, which, again, are not eight inch gunfire, but something on a dark night. They see it in a war uh, zone, in a war zone, <laughs> as well as the flares that were dropped by the aforementioned uh, 
cruiser scout planes. They drop flares to illuminate the Allied ships. Mm-hmm. Flares going off overhead. Nothing's happening here. They also, the, the OOD sighted, could see clearly Canberra swinging out of line to unmask her main battery and yet never put two and two together that, hey, something's going down up ahead. Something is clearly not, not right here. None of this was put together as an enemy threat. Chicago's captain, Bodie or Bode, whoever, reached the bridge shortly before, and I'm talking like a minute or so, before mm-hmm. his ship was struck by one of those long lances that was launched. Uh, Chicago's hit up on the starboard bow, I believe. Mm-hmm. And at this point, all of a sudden, life starts to you know spring aboard on USS Chicago. GQ is sounded, mm-hmm. but it's almost it's well, it's not almost too late. It is too late at this point. Uh, seemingly blind to the gunfire that is erupting all around them. You got to remember now the Japanese cruisers are lighting Canberra up. I mean, they are just unloading on this thing. Chicago and Bodie could not find anything to unleash their main battery at, which is mind boggling to me. I mean, I know you just sounded GQ, Mm -hmm. but still, how can you not see what is shooting at you? The flashes. Yeah. You, you see it. It's good gravy. and, And of course they're, getting on the radio and alert, alerting everybody that uh, of the threat that they've just detected, right? No. Wrong. No. They don't do that. And again, as you as you, we replay this story here, it's very hard to, to not come to the conclusion that these people were comically incompetent. It, but it would have really because because we're going to repeat this story. And we're talking about the captains of these ships, by the way, not the captains necessarily and, the crew, and the yeah. and the crews, right? So mm-hmm. and the watch officers. I'll I'll limit it to the watch officers. But we're going to repeat this story for three more cruisers. Yeah, it's where the where it's going to play out almost exactly the same way. And what that points to was a gross training failure on the part of the commodore and the fleet commander, and. It resulted, manifested in the death of a thousand sailors. Yeah. And so th- this is inexcusable, mm-hmm. inexcusable. And you got warning happened. after, yeah, you got warning after warning before the event. And now the event is unfolding and you're still not reacting appropriately. Now, there are factors that go into this and we'll get into that in a second. Mm-hmm. Back to Chicago, the USS Chicago, not the city. Um, s- Chicago's eventually does unleash some fire with her main battery. It's not known if she actually hit anything. Her secondary battery actually does hit a few ships, uh, specifically at least one, they think for sure. Uh, the, the, the Tenryu, the, the Japanese uh, ship Tenryu, they do hit it. They don't sink it, but they hit it. And worse yet, as Bodhi's ship takes a torpedo, and I mean, again, these are the ship killers. These are, you know, we didn't know anything about the long lances, but it's pretty evident that Chicago took a pretty good lick. He immediately withdraws. Without orders, he just immediately Bodhi says, "Nope, we're out of here." Boom, and he turns around and he he. And of course, he it. radios everybody to warn them right as he withdraws. Doesn't say no. a word, and this is the worst he thing doesn't. that he could have possibly done or not done. However, you want to look at it, is he immediately, immediately? There's no need to keep radio silence here anymore. You know, no. the enemy is here, and they are kicking your ass. It, you should. He should have gotten on the radio and broadcast it for the whole world to hear. We are under attack by an enemy surface force. Mm. Yeah, wake up yeah. you know, it's and one thing for brave sir robin to run away yeah. but it's another thing for him not to warn everybody else who's about to come under fire this this is yeah and this is without a doubt the most inexcusable action of the entire battle in my opinion is had Bodie signaled a warning to the cruisers up north the vincennes the historian which Quincy. haven't been engaged yet exactly he said, hey, we are under attack by an enemy surface force. Give him a couple of minutes to man general quarters and yeah. be ready. Yeah. And he he failed to do that. And quite the opposite. He didn't send any message at all. And he turned around and he hightailed it. He hightailed it straight out of the operating area. His orders were to protect the transports at, essentially at all costs. And without orders to withdraw, he took his ship out of there as fast as he could get it and left the transports high and dry. And that's just and that's the southern group, right? This is the correct. first group to be engaged. How long did this engagement last? Is this with the southern group? This is this is what's even it's astonishing in that the, the destruction took place this fast, but it's also unbelievable in the in the in the terms of the Japanese efficiency. Seven minutes. 
So half of our battle force that's there to protect the transports that are landing the Marines is destroyed in seven minutes. Seven it's rendered minutes. ineffective in ineffective seven, seven minutes. In seven minutes, yeah, because Chicago's not sunk, at least not here. She is later, but she's not sunk here. She just hauls ass. She's out of here. Mm. The one bright spot, if there is a bright spot at all, and frankly, there isn't, but if there is one, this is it, is the USS it's Patterson. The little destroyer. The little destroyer. And this is something that you'll hear about <laughs> throughout the war. American destroyers, Yeah, they were tough, man. They did not give up. Uh, USS Patterson is commanded by uh, by Commander Frank Walker. Uh, Frank Walker was keenly aware of the Japanese ships in the area. As a matter of fact, not only did he radio that there, uh, he tried to warn Canberra and Chicago of the Japanese ships by blinker light, but it apparently was unseen. Realizing that his warning was apparently unnoticed by the the heavy cruisers he got on the tbs which is the talk between ships and basically well he didn't basically he said warning warning enemy ships strange enemy ships entering the area or strange, strange ships strange ships i think yeah, he said, strange right? ships entering the area and it was either ignored or unheard mm. but no well, i think th- didn't somebody in turner staff receive the the message they um, did they did yeah. they did but but the but point the of the matter ships is, is in, the, the, in the group right yeah the ships that are going to be sunk or heavily damaged didn't but patterson under the command of walker they're they're not going down without a fight he starts lighting up everything he can find with his five inch gun battery and they do five inch gun yeah and they do some damage you know he yeah. i believe he hits yeah he gets in a gun duel with the tenryu that i mentioned before that was hit by chicago and the yabari he illuminates them and uh zigzags to avoid their fire and destroyers are obviously highly maneuverable ships mm-hmm. um she did get hit and it's thought she got hit by one of the heavy cruisers in the japanese force that disabled her after five inch guns but and the japanese think that they sunk her and patterson goes out and comes back into the fight and undeterred by the damage that she suffers walker is going in there and he's swinging with everything he's got only after he receives orders to withdraw and cover the transports does he finally, you know, hesitatingly turn yes. around and, and get out of there. But he was determined to do whatever he could to do something. And, and he is really, well, he's not really, he is the only skipper in that entire Southern force that did what he was out there to do, which was to do his best to protect the transports. Now, while all this debacle is heading is, is going down, down South, we uh, we talk about the northern debacle, which well, is there's yeah, since the three the cruisers southern, up south. Since the southern group becomes the sacrificial anode, to use the navy expression, right? Then the northern group must have fared better because they would have been warned all this is happening, right? Infinitely worse, man. It's it, it's it's no. I mean, well, to answer your question, no, they're yeah. not warned at all. Uh, <laughs> After Mikawa goes in there and shoots the living bejesus out of the southern force, as I said, in seven minutes flat, he turns north and he heads for the northern group of American. Now, these are American ships up here, heavy cruisers, the Vincennes, the Quincy, and the Astoria. Um, Astonishingly, as we are alluding to here, the northern group still had no earthly idea that the Japanese were there. And now we're we're not talking about 100 miles away. We're talking within visual range. Mm -hmm. There were storms out that night, squalls, rain, rain squalls. There were heavy mist that was floating around and you know, over the sea that was, I don't want to say blocking visual view, but it was hindering visual view. Yet, there were gunfire, gunfire flashes still seen aboard these heavy cruisers, and yet nothing was put together. Nothing was yeah. put together. USS Vincennes is under the commander uh, under the command of Captain Reef Cole, who I mentioned before. He's essentially the senior officer. What did you call him again? He's SOPA. SOPA. Senior officer, president of float. Uh, yeah. That this is this is the man. Uh Reef Cole has his ship, the USS Vincennes, and they are all, all three cruisers are at condition two, which is not general quarters, but it is manned to a point. Uh Reef Cole himself is asleep. He's still sleeping as the Southern Fourth is being Southern Southern Force is being utterly destroyed by McCallum. Uh, he was under the assumption, Reef Cole was under the assumption that Japanese ships might attack that night, mm-hmm. yet he failed to disseminate that information to any other living soul on any of the other cruisers within this force. 
This is what he claimed after the fact that mm-hmm. it was, you know, that this, and it was. It actually makes it worse, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Failure of command from the highest level all the way down here. So as the CEO of the Northern Group, as the SOPA of the Northern Group, he is at fault for their lack of readiness. He really is. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, this he's left in charge and he's not performing here, is he? At 0144, watches aboard all three of the heavy cruisers up north felt underwater explosions. Now, these are the Japanese long lances exploding on the uh, southern force down there. This is the, Can- uh, not the Canberra, the, Sh- the Chicago. And, you know, they're feeling underwater explosions. A lot of the, the thought is, too, that these tor- torpedoes that were initially fired missed, and they ran to their extreme range and exploded. But this is what the force is feeling up north, and it's thought that they are anti-submarine actions down south. So even if they're right, and they then they, and they're believed that somebody is conducting an ASW anti-submarine warfare attack, mm-hmm. the only right response is still man battle stations, go to general quarters. Yep. And because they, look, a submarine could be attacking you next. So right. you know, you just don't keep sleeping in in, in condition two. And but so that's exactly is, what they did. Yeah, this is crazy. Yeah. Gunfire is seen. Flashes are seen south. And at this point, only at this point, does the OOD get a hold of Captain Reef Call, wakes him up from a deep sleep and says, yeah, Captain, you might want to come to the bridge. Something's going down, down south. Unfortunately, it's, it's too late at this point. At 0145 is when the watches see the gunfire and the flares from the south but failed to, even though they saw the gunfire and the flares and everything else, and I mean, you know, a slaughter going on down south, they still yet did not put everything together. No contact reports are given to him. And at 0150, five minutes after he reaches the bridge, his three cruisers are illuminated by Macau's ships. So we're talking- These you know, are the searchlights again. These are the because searchlights. Optical targeting. And at this point, it's too late, man. He thought Reef Cole, still under the assumption that there were no Japanese in the air, despite the, tor- the torpedoes exploding or the underwater explosions, whatever you want to say, the gunfire, the, the flares, gun the whole deal. Mm-hmm. When he's illuminated, he instinctively thinks that it's Friendly his own ships, ships illuminating illuminate. him. <laughs> hey, hey, guys, it's me. Yeah. Turn out the lights. And that's essentially what he said. He's like, you know, hey, you know, we're, we're friendly. Don't shoot. Well, no, they weren't. Because one minute later. Uh, Japanese opened fire on Astoria was the first target that they opened fire on, followed by Vincennes and Quincy in that order. And Quincy is actually the first ship that is hit. So, again, the ultimate precision and accuracy of the Japanese nighttime naval gunfire and torpedoes are it's just crushingly put to display right here. Yet again, just a few minutes after the southern force is southern southern force is just ultimately destroyed aboard the USS Astoria. As I said, the ship was not at GQ. But the gunnery officer, had, after having witnessed shell firing flashes, ordered the main battery to commence firing. So this goes into what you were saying earlier, Bill, that, you know, junior officers, he's not really so junior if he's if he's the um, if he's the, the gunnery officer. officer the but deck, uh, yeah, but maybe, maybe a JG, maybe a lieutenant, maybe, still pretty junior. I, 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 frankly, I didn't unfortunately write the gentleman's name down, but he yeah. actually said, you know what? This ain't this. This is not cool. Open fire. Commence he fire. orders the main battery to commence firing. Captain Greenman, the CEO of Astoria, as they call him, nasty asty, he arrives on on the bridge and he immediately orders ceasefire because he yeah, my, thinks that my first CEO was also named Captain Greenman, and I always wondered if they're related. I don't think they are, but but I never did ask him ask my CEO whether because uh, I'm not. Sh- I don't know whether he would have been proud of being related to this guy or not, uh. but. Uh, you know, always remember that it's not a uh, not he did he didn't do well <laughs> in, in this event. Let's just say Greenman gets on the bridge and he immediately orders ceasefire because he, like Reef Cole, assumed that they're firing at friendly ships. Only when his ship starts getting pounded by Japanese naval guns does he realize no, these guys aren't friendly, and even if they are, we got to sh- something has to give here. So he immediately orders again to commence firing yet again. But at this point, it's too damn late Mm -hmm. Uh, for, let's see, hold on. I lost my place here. Oh yeah. I'm sorry. So Astoria is hit in the hangar deck. Now you got to remember American cruisers carried just like Japanese planes. I mean, just like Japanese cruisers carried scout planes. Um, But unlike Japanese 
cruisers who at, at this point in the war at this point in the war yeah we have hangar decks on these cruisers and the um, airplanes are fueled with gasoline mm -hmm. and Ab gasoline gas, yeah. is extremely explosive and and burns like crazy and we hadn't just figured out it's probably not a good idea to have all this gasoline on the, on the hangar deck yeah. on these cruisers and so these scout planes you know, later in the war, we would take the gasoline off and in some cases the scout planes off. But at this point, there they were. And what happens when the Astoria gets hit? Oh, she becomes a she's a bonfire because some of the first. Yeah, yeah, some of the first hits are in that hangar deck. They hit the aircraft, they hit the Avgas and it, they're not ship killing hits, but she's a beacon of light for every Japanese <laughs> ship in Gone. the area that's already illuminated the target. Yeah, hey, yeah. aim at the fire. Yeah, shoot at the fire. And that's exactly what they do for 10-ish minutes. Astoria was the focus of Aoba, Kinugasa, and Chukai's main battery. So she is just beaten to a pulp. Most of her main battery, Astoria's main battery, is disabled. Her comms were completely wiped out, and fires were literally stem to stern. She is, as I said, a beacon of light for every Japanese gun in the force to shoot at her. And that's exactly what they do. She fires one last salvo, Astoria does, before you know it's it's all over. Mm -hmm. And um, that one salvo actually sails over the intended target. I forget what the intended target was. And winds up hitting Chokai, the Japanese cruiser Chokai. And it knocks out one of her turrets briefly. I don't know if it actually knocked it out permanently in the battle, but it did hit it and knock it out for a brief amount of time shortly thereafter astoria slides to a halt and she's a fire from bow to stern she's just she's gone she's a goner that's not all uh aboard uss quincy which is just right next to astoria here uh fires were seen to the south gunfire was heard and quincy's and this is even sadder quincy's radar picks up the japanese ships Captain Moore aboard the Quincy ordered the main battery to open fire, but they weren't ready. Why? Because they weren't a GQ. Yet again, even after all this, the ship hadn't sounded general quarters. They were not ready to fight. Hit by several shells, the Quincy is a fire due to her SOC airplanes. And this is a recurring theme. This happens aboard all three American heavy cruisers here. They're hitting the hangar deck, and that's not necessarily where the Japanese were targeting, but that's which happened. It just happened to be where the shells land. And they set the SOC uh, airplanes afire. They set the Avgas afire. And it's really not needed for the Japanese to illuminate the target because you can see them a mile away. And it's just, it's a pounding of biblical proportions that the ship takes here. At 2.04, she's hit by two torpedoes on the port side. At 2.16, with her captain dead and most of her bridge crew dead, she's hit by another torpedo. This is Quincy now. And she begins to sink. Uh, Quincy, if I'm not mistaken, Bill, you might remember, I think she's the first ship to go down in Iron yep. Bottom Sound. That is correct. Yep. Yeah. But so, not the last, hence no. the name Iron Bottom Sound. No, yeah, unfortunately not the last. All three, and counting Canberra, four of these cruisers that are involved in this action all eventually come to rest on the bottom of Iron Bottom Sound. Aboard Vincennes, the aforementioned Vincennes and Captain Reef Cole, now finally alert to the situation. Ordered open fire, but his ship was hit in the hangar, and it too, like the other two, uh, like her other two sisters, served as a flaming beacon for Japanese gunners. So again, the illumination on the by the Japanese cruisers wasn't necessary because they could see their target plainly. Uh, Vincennes is hit by a torpedo, then another, and a, finally a third that we know of, maybe more, uh, killing everyone in the number one fire room and opening the ship's bottom up like a tuna can. Uh, these are the ship killing long lance torpedoes that we've been talking about the whole episode. They do exactly what they're designed to do. And they just utterly eviscerate uh, the Vincennes here. So at this point, this is 216, 0216 hours. Mikawa's victory off the coast of Savo Island is complete. Or is it? He was under orders to attack the American, or he had issued orders to the attack transports. the American force as well as the transports, which are right. now wide open for attack. And this is something that he, Macau was, you know, hammered for by Yamamoto later uh, after the fact, after it was revealed that he failed to attack the transports. We're Macau a story over and over again where Japanese snatched, I wouldn't say snatched defeat in this case, because they won, they were victorious, yeah. but, but pulled, pulled up short 
because it happens again later in Leyte and in other places where they could have absolutely cemented their victorious position and yet for some reason disengaged. Well, the reasoning behind the thought is the reasoning behind Macau is, you know, reason to basically get out of there is that he knew he had won a great victory at that point. And yes, mm -hmm. he hadn't attacked the Japanese, I mean the Japanese, he hadn't attacked the American transports anchored off Tulagi and Guadalca, off Alonga Point. But he was also fully aware that by hanging around and shooting up the American transports that are anchored off Alonga Point, he's going to become dangerously close to daybreak. Yep. He had no earthly idea where the American carriers were. He knew that they were theoretically in the area, but he, had, he had no, no idea care, where. Air cover himself. None. Zero. Right. He was keenly aware that if he was, if his force was sighted by the American carriers and attacked, eh, it would not fare very well. So to protect his force, he turns around, flank speed, and they're gone. They're out of there. Admiral Turner stops unloading the transports at 0145. This is while the Southern force is getting pounded and the Northern force is getting pounded. This is He sees what's going on. He doesn't know exactly what's going on, but he puts two and two together that somebody's taking a beating out there. He stops unloading his transports, and uh, I'm not really sure what happens here. And frankly, my 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 research was not complete in that area. He had planned to leave at that point, basically mm -hmm. weigh anchor and get out of there to but, protect the transports and the ships that were remaining. Right. Exactly. But he decides to stay another day. He decides to stay another day and unload as much of the supplies for the Marines ashore as he possibly could without air cover. Now, Macau assumed, Macau assumed that American aircraft carriers were in the area and that he would be under attack at any moment once the sun came up. Richmond Kelly Turner was fully aware that the American aircraft carriers were nowhere near Guadalcanal and ready to launch an attack in the morning. So he decides to hang around for all his faults. He decides to hang around and continue the unloading of the transports without air cover. So that's, you know. And again, no, nobody exercising overall command here mm -hmm. on the American side because you got Fletcher doing mm -hmm. whatever it is he wanted to do. You got Turner who's responsible for getting all this equipment ashore to support the Marines. And the guy who's supposed to be in charge is in New Caledonia, absolutely disengaged from everything that's going on. Gormley, we're talking about Gormley. Gormley. Yeah, right. So the following, well, I guess it'd be early, early, early morning on the 9th, uh, Turner requested from Fletcher, who was still running away. And let's be clear, Fletcher turned around. Now, he had lost a lot of his fighters on August 7th, and we're going to, you know, we covered that in the previous episode. But... He his job was still to cover those forces, the the you know the the transport forces, and he failed to do that. He right. he turned around and he booked it. He cruised out of there. And Turner requested air remember cover from Fletcher. From our previous episode, the King was no fan of Fletcher's. Yeah, well, this doesn't and, cement his legacy, that's for sure. And and again, this was King's idea to attack Guadalcanal and to to you know invade, mm -hmm. and um, and now we've suffered the greatest. The, the worst loss in U.S. Navy's history executing the plan that King put together. Mm -hmm. And and when he sees that Fletcher essentially ran away, um, now Fletcher would probably argue that he was following Nimitz's doctrine of calculated risk, calculated mm -hmm. risk right? Trying to protect his force. King didn't see it that way. Mm -hmm. King saw him running away and leaving the landing forces and the surface forces exposed. Well, and I mean, you know, the argument can be made that that is exactly what he did, because as Turner requests air cover at 0641 on the 9th of August, he received his answer in a roundabout way, not from Fletcher, but he intercepted a message that was from Fletcher to Gormley that essentially said that Fletcher was out. <laughs> He was yeah. done. He was taking his cares. Now, again, he's not he's not, you know, going back to the U.S. He's not going back to Pearl Harbor, but he is he's pulling his care. Yes, yeah. he is pulling his cares out of the area of mm -hmm. operations for the present time. Figure and out that, who else can help them, because I'm not going to. I can't do it now or I'm not going to do it now. And he essentially said that at this point now, Turner is now the force commander around, around Guadalcanal. Mm -hmm. And that is, in my opinion, pitiful. That was a on Fletcher's mm -hmm. point. 
yeah, he, he basically um, gave up command to yeah. Turner and you know, should have been fired at that point. He but, abdicated the throne, you know. <laughs> that's it. That's another yeah. story for a different yeah. day. Indeed. Now we're going to wrap it up, but let's let let's just talk about this one missed opportunity by the Japanese, which I'm very thankful that they missed the opportunity personally and professionally. But had Mikawa actually done completed his mission, yes, he came in there and he absolutely beat the United States and 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 you know the the Allied forces right there beat him to a pulp. Again, reinforcing this point, Seth, he didn't know that our carriers were sure. running away, that we were becoming brave Sir Robin, like Bodhi had, the carrier force was like Bodhi or Bode had done earlier. True. They were running away. He didn't know that. But but if he had said, I don't care, I'm going to take my chances and I'm going to continue to press my attack. Go ahead. What were you, what would have happened? He if I'm not saying he would have sunk all the transports off the coast. But he had less, he had more than 60% of his ammunition in mm-hmm. those lockers on those four cruisers. He had a little, little less than half of his torpedo armament. He could have done some serious damage. I mean, he might he, not have sank them all. There would have been nothing stopping him from sinking every one of those transports. And the Battle of Guadalcanal would have ended that day. Yes, it would. And that's my point is that had he gone through with what he was supposed to have done and frankly could have done with a free hand. Guadalcanal would have been a catastrophic defeat for the United States. The first Marine Division literally would have been marooned on Guadalcanal. And remember when we were talking about Midway, we said Midway is commonly thought of the turning point, but it's not really. Guadalcanal is really the turning point of the war. That would have not happened. Yeah. Guadalcanal would not have been. It would have been. Who would have known what would happen to King? ignomious, ignomious, whatever the word is, defeat, when he pressed this, you know, basically over Marshall's objections, Mm -hmm. convinced, um, you know, Roosevelt that this was the right action in in light of the fact that the British are dragging their feet and it's going to be a while before we land at North Africa. Why don't we use these forces on an offensive? And then we get our clock cleaned. Yeah. You know, who who knows if King would have survived that? Who knows if Nimitz would have survived that? I don't he would think have changed so. the entire outcome of the war. This mm-hmm. one battle of Savo Island, this one withdrawal of the carrier forces to, you know, be, brave Sir Robin running away, and there was one decision by Makawa to disengage. Mm-hmm. Any one of those things different, the entire war would have, outcome would have been altered. Certainly this aspect of it, certainly this phase of it, you know, mm. there would have been no more Guadalcanal. It, it would have been over. And it, I mean, and I really don't think that there's anybody who can make an argument to the contrary. I mean, yeah, if if, no. if all the transports are sunk and the Marines are marooned there, we got to go get them or we leave them to wither on the vine. And I argue that we probably leave them to wither on the vine. And it, it now what? You know, yeah. Now what? Now no. it's. And kind of closing where I started off with the the notion that if you buy into the mythology that the Navy abandoned the Marine Corps, 1,077 sailors were killed on those four cruisers that were right. sunk. Right. And and in, nobody had died ashore at and this point, I'm pretty not, sure, right? Not not in those kind of numbers. I mean, I mean there were a few people. Maybe been, Tulagi, yeah. we, we lost some Marines. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. landing at Tulagi. I'm sorry. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. and the Raiders, the Marine Raiders and such. Um, but but it was in, you know, s- small tens, not 1,077. And again, if the, the fleet's destroyed, the mission ashore fails. Right. You can't protect those Marines. You can't, and sailors, Marines and sailors ashore. You can't protect the, the supplies. Uh, you, they die. And and the get the battle's over. So at some point, those ships have to survive. And so regrouping, rethinking our tra- tactics and strategy and how we're going to protect those forces ashore was critical at this point. And yeah, mm-hmm. it caused, I always say, the Marines suffered highly on the misery scale oh, yeah. during the, the Guadalcanal campaign in terms of misery suffered way more than the Navy did, but the Navy suffered 
three or four times as many fatalities mm -hmm. as the Marines suffered during the Guadalcanal campaign. And we can't lose sight of that fact. Damn near on this night alone. And, and to, as you said, there are 1,077 Allied sailors that were killed on this night. A further 700-ish were wounded. The Japanese losses, this will tell you how much you know the victory is lopsided. Out, out of balance it was, yeah. Oh, my God. 129 Japanese killed and 85 were wounded. No sinkings. Mm -hmm. So this is an utter beatdown, uh, you know, at the hands of the Japanese Navy and, you know, to, for the United States. And this is unfortunately, while it's the first time that it happens, it's not the last. Now, granted, the other surface battles that we're going to talk about in depth as we go along through the campaign here were not this one sided. But I mean, it, we learned a lot. You know, I call Guadalcanal the classroom. And this is the beginning of the Navy's yep. class it's classroom on amphibious operations yeah. and how to conduct landings yep. classroom on naval engagements yep. classroom on how to screen yeah. Na Navy battles from the submarine air search force stand yeah. on air search on the importance of um, identification. What we call uh, target recognition mm -hmm. by, by looking at something and being able to determine what kind of ship that is. It was almost as if we didn't prepare at all for this battle. Almost as if we we manned a bunch of ships with brand new sailors who'd never been at sea before, who never thought for one minute how to fight a war and go out there and stand guard around yeah. Savo Island and see how it turns out. It, it's a tragedy. And it I'm is. Not. It is. And and there's so many lessons still to be learned today from this battle. Mm -hmm. It should be required study for every Navy and Marine officer on active duty today. Yeah, it, without doubt, because there, there's so many failures of command. There's so many, you know, there's so many what ifs, but there's so many failures at really every level, especially the higher levels. Now, you know, I don't want to say, you know, the, the, the average sailor because they're doing what they're told. Mm -hmm. But at the higher levels of command, you know, from Crushley, Turner, you know, yep. all the way down, Bodie, all you know, Reef Cole, all these guys, Greenman, it's just a failure after failure after failure. And it's 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 not repeated in the same level, but it, 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 it's it, never again this bad. No, but but it's it's not very good, you know, and, and we'll get to you know Cape mm -hmm. Esperance and and yes, that's that is a victory, but <laughs> but but slightly but, tilted in our favor for that one. Yeah, right? but I mean, I mean we'll talk about Friday the 13th mm -hmm. and we'll talk about you know the, the the battleship shootout and everything else, but but this is this informs everything else. But it, but even then, it takes a long time to learn those lessons. I and mean, we're still learning the lessons, we're still repeating a lot of the mistakes. From Savo Island in August, we're repeating the same mistakes again in November of the same right. year. So yep. the lessons are there, but they're not always taken to heart. Mm. And we could keep going on and on and railing on for hours about this. And, but it, and we're gonna it is, we spend a lot of time on this, Seth, but it is so important Absolutely. to the outcome of the war and frankly to the history and you know heritage of the United States Navy. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it just, it's an important it needs to be understood. It's an important event that informs everything that happens afterward around the seas of Guadalcanal. It, literally everything, you know, from decisions made by Gormley or lack thereof uh, to decisions made by his successor, successor Admiral Halsey, to uh, the the assignment of specific people to mm -hmm. commands. And I, I, you're going to hear a lot about this guy, Willis Lee, Admiral uh, Nimitz. Puts Battle him Chicago. in command. Yeah, they put him in there. He puts him in there for a reason. And we'll get to that. And I can't wait for that one personally. But but this event, you know, alters everything. And 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 you'll see that or you'll hear that, depending if you're watching or you're listening as we go through the rest of this campaign. So with that, uh, we want to thank you for listening in on our conversation. Uh, please subscribe to the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast wherever you receive your podcast and give us a rating and a review. Also, if you want to see the video version of this and any of our other episodes, subscribe to our YouTube channel called the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. Also, look us up on Facebook, like and subscribe to our page there as well. If you have a question, comment or suggestion, send us an e email at unauthorizedpacificpodcast at gmail.com. And once again, finally for today, uh, my name is Seth Paradon. I want to thank you all very much, Bill. And I'm Bill Toady, uh, retired Navy captain. Thank you for listening in. 
important lessons and there's still plenty more coming. So thank you all and we'll see you next week.